Hi everyone, good afternoon. I'm Sabrina and today I will be presenting the research that I did during my master's project where I analysed enthusial change and factors that confound activity interpretation from them using a sample from Medieval Exeter. Just to warn you that some of the following slides will contain pictures of human skeletal remains. So a bone symbol, like the one you can see on this slide, will appear on the top left of slides preceding the ones containing pictures of human remains. I just wanted to warn you in case that's something that disturbs you, so if you wanted to get a tea or something before the next presentation, that's perfectly fine. I won't be offended at all. So what are enthesial changes? So entheses, singular enthesis, are the sites where tendons and ligaments attach into bone. They can vary in size and shape, and this variation is known as enthesial change, which is often abbreviated to EC. Enthesial changes have been previously known by other names such as musculoskeletal stress markers, which was coined by Hawke and Merbs in 1995, and they've also been known as enthesopathies, for example, in Alves, Cardoso, and Henderson, 2010. The term enthesial changes is used here following Germain and Velot, 2010, in that it is more neutral and doesn't suggest a particular cause behind the changes. So this project focused on fibrocartilaginous FC entheses, and you can see the diagram, where tendons and ligaments connect to the bone via a layer of fibrocartilage. And in long bones, these um, FC entheses occur close to the ends of the bone, for example, around the top of the ulna, which is one of the bones of the forearm. FC entheses are suggested to be more susceptible to wear and tear than fibrous entheses. And fibrous entheses are where tendons and ligaments connect directly to the bone, or the periosteum which is the membrane that covers the bone surface. And on long bones, fibrous entheses occur more in the shaft region, or the middle part of the long bone. So the tide mark is the surface of the calcified fibrocartilage, where the soft tissue has hardened, and you can see it on dry bone, which is bone without any soft tissue. And so the tide mark is what I was looking at in this project when I was assessing the enthesial changes. So why have researchers been interested in looking at EC? Basically, bone is made up of living cells. Being living tissue, bone will react to different circumstances and one of these circumstances is mechanical stress, also known as loading stress, biomechanical loading stress, and other terms like that. Um, for example, when the bone has to deal with lifting something heavy. Um, as EC are partly a reaction to mechanical stress through increased blood flow and bone growth, they've been associated with activity. FC entheses are also suggested to be more useful for activity-related research than fibrous entheses for example, by Weiss in 2015. However, activity is not the only thing that affects EC. It is also often reported that age affects EC expression, as well as EC having links to sex, male slash female, and body size, amongst other factors. These other factors can model the interpretation of activity from EC which is why they are often called confounding factors. Well, the causes of EC are multifactorial and still being researched, and there's an ongoing debate in EC and EC-related literature over issues such as which factor is the predominant confounder in activity interpretation, whether confounders affect some entheses more than others, and whether activity can still be interpreted reliably. There are many more studies and articles out there than shown on this slide. I just can't fit them all on here. There's a lot. 
to read up on if you're interested in this area. After seeing the variation concerning the confounding factors reported in the literature, I wanted to explore the extent to which age, sex and body size affect EC in my sample. At this point, especially considering the inherent constraints of a dissertation time frame, I wasn't interested in relating activity to the EC in my sample. I just wanted to focus on the confounding factors and see which was significant and in what order. Through getting more clarification about confounding factor effects, I wanted to work towards establishing more confidently whether activity interpretations using EC were reliable or not. As activity interpretations are relevant to a lot of topics, for example, looking at subsistence strategies, identification of persons of historical interest, gender archaeology, looking at past socioeconomic inequality, just to name a few topics, it would be quite useful to know more about what limitations to look out for in this kind of research. So the method that I used to score EC in my sample was the recently developed Coimbra method, um, more on this in the next slide, um, which will have photos of bones in it. And um, the methods that I used to construct the biological profile for each individual, which includes the estimations for age, sex, height, and mass, I um, followed standardized methods widely used in osteology. So the Coimbra method is a standardized system that uses visual qualitative evaluation of EC variation developed for FC emphases. It splits the emphasis into two zones and has separate EC features and scoring criteria within each zone. For example, the EC features to score in zone one are bone formation and erosion. There's a lot more information about this in the papers published on this method. In my project, I made sure to differentiate the left and right sides while scoring the EC, as one of my further analyses that I wanted to do was explore bilaterality in my sample, as in I wanted to see whether there were significant differences between EC scores on the left or right side of a pair of bones, for example, whether the EC scores on the left clavicle's emphases were significantly different to the ones on the right clavicle. I analysed a sample of 30 skeletons from different medieval sites in Exeter. I selected these skeletons after a preliminary evaluation. The criteria I was looking for were skeletons from approximately the same time period and region with good preservation to allow assessment of emphases and biological profiles. I also analysed only adult skeletons as the Coimbra method was developed with adults and also using an adult sample would be comparable with previous EC studies that investigated adult samples. However, I believe Palmer et al. 2017 has proposed a standardised method for scoring EC in non-adult skeletons, which would be really interesting for future research. For this project, while I wasn't testing activity effect in my sample, because my root interest is in improving activity-related research, I looked at upper limb FC entheses as they are suggested to be more reflective of activity than lower limb entheses, for example, by Eid et al. in 2019. These upper limb entheses have also been examined in much of the literature regarding EC, so there is comparability. This map shows the Exeter archaeological sites that my sample was drawn from. Blue indicates the war memorial, orange indicates a cathedral close St. Mary Major, green indicates Princess Hay, and purple indicates Friars Gate. I used a repeated measures approach to analyse my data, i.e. each emphasis's modal EC score 
which is the EC score most frequently recorded for that specific emphasis for that person, was treated as an individual data point. So one individual could yield a maximum of 32 data points, and this repeated measures approach also accounts for the fact that multiple EC scores come from the same individual. So plotting the modal EC scores against age, it doesn't look like there is any real trend one way or another. And the same can be said for the other confounding factors too. And then I checked this using ordinal logistic regression for each factor. Age was not significant as the p-value was 0 0.9934, which is greater than 0 0.05. So a p-value less than or equal to 0 0.05 would be considered statistically significant and this was greater than 0 0.05. So sex also was not significant as the p-value was 0 0.888, which is, again, greater than 0 0.05. For stature, also not significant, as the p-value was 0 0.9442. And for mass, it was also not significant, as the p-value was 0 0.9848. Now, I won't lie, I was a bit surprised by this result. I was expecting at least one of the factors to have a significant effect based on the literature's reports. And I wondered if there was an unmeasured variable that had a significant effect on the EC score. For example, activity or population differences. So there are lots of potential avenues for future research. I am particularly interested in exploring interpopulation variation between identified skeletal collections and also the use of different EC scoring methods between studies as I think these could have contributed significantly to the literature's disagreement over confounding factors. Even with the data I have already collected here, there are more analyses I can do for Example, comparing EC scores between the different sites in Exeter that I sampled from. Comparing EC scores for individual EC features. For example, comparing scores for a textual change in zone 2. And I could also look at bilateral asymmetry, which I mentioned in a previous slide, as I'd recorded the side for each EC score. And it would also be interesting to look at EC patterns in muscle groups. For example, the muscles of the rotator cuff, the subscapularis, teres minor, supraspinatus, and infraspinatus muscles, which are all emphases that I looked at in this project. I could also explore the types of activity undertaken more generally by the people in this period and region, and see how it might relate to my data. It would also be interesting to examine EC in individuals with pathology that have been suggested to have links to EC, such as osteoarthritis or DISH, diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. And here is my selected bibliography. It's really not exhaustive. There's, there are so many more <laughs> studies and articles out there to read if you're interested in finding out more about this research area. And just before I finish, I would like to say thank you to the University of Exeter, where I did my master's, the archaeology department there, and the university's Global Excellence Scholarship, which supported me while I was doing my master's. I would also like to thank my supervisor, Dr. Katrina McKenzie, my tutor, Dr. Laura Evis, and Dr. Mandy Kingdom, who ran the practical on how to use the Coimbra method. And last but not least, my sister Tiffany Key for helpful discussions about statistical analyses. Thank you so much for your time. I hope you found this interesting. I'm 
really looking forward to seeing all the other presentations today. Thank you again.